Easter. Easter. The time where we celebrate the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. A time where we understand and it is made clear and evident to us that dead things can live again. And just like the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in us. Come alive to the dead dreams. Come alive to the dead visions. Come alive to the dead relationships. Come alive to the dead marriages. Come alive to the dead lives and to the futures that lay barren. We believe that this resurrection life is in us and we prophetically declare to everything in our life and in our future, come alive in Jesus' name. Well, this has been a great week and I'm believing God's gonna end strong, amen? When he was at the wedding, of Canaan and Galilee and he turned the water into wine. The guest said, you saved the best for last. So uh, I'm believing that here in our last, well, we've got our Redemption Espanol coming after this, but I believe God's gonna end today strong and cap everything off that he's doing, amen. I vacillated, <laughs> I'm gonna let y'all into my world a little bit. I really struggled and I finally had to chart a course at the nine o'clock service back and forth between two messages. I mean, really, really struggled. Uh, in fact, I didn't really know till I got to this table which one I was gonna go with. <clears throat> uh, it is my norm, the way I've made my life work is it takes me a half a day to a day to prepare my messages. Uh, it used to take me all day. Now, I know a little more than I did 20 years ago, so maybe not quite as long. But on a week where you have to speak four or five times, it's hard to have the four or five days to prepare messages. So the Sunday after a conference, after a big event like this last one, is usually when I will dig out of my 30-year well and get those messages that I've preached before but you hadn't heard before. And um, I was heading in that direction, but then late Saturday night, as though I needed to stay up another night, looking forward to going to bed and uh then late last night god just man started downloading something and i uh, bought, i just had my phone i just started typing a bunch of notes in my phone and there are some words that is a finely tuned message that i have put in order to take you on a journey somewhere but then there are others that it's not been packaged what that well because i haven't had time but it's prophetic what does that mean it means I abandon all the sermonization because there's a word, a single word that you have to get before your next season can open up in your life. This is one such word this morning that I'm gonna to speak to you. So we are in a special moment if you would give me the grace to speak. Hallelujah. I am going to, uh, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. Guys, if you would, turn to Acts chapter 16. And after I read that, I'll probably only read one more. I don't think I'll read the rest of them. I won't get there. I won't have time. So if you don't like this message, you're going to have to talk to God about keeping me up late on Saturday night. <laughs> Acts chapter 16. But at midnight, Everything in the Bible is significant. If he's telling us a time, there's a reason they're telling us what time. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening. There's always somebody listening. There's always somebody watching. I can't tell you how many times I thought I was affecting people with my teaching and I was not. I was affecting them by my life because they were watching. And I've been watching, Pastor, how you treat your wife. And I've been watching how you respond to disappointment. And I've been watching what you do in times of failure. And I've been watching how you treat your staff and that, all the time. Somebody's listening. Somebody's watching. So here's Paul and Silas. They're the only Christians in there. And they're put in jail and all the rest of the prisoners say, well, let's see what they do now. Okay? Because when hard times come, your faith is on trial. Not in front of you, but in front of everybody else. 
suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. That is one of the most amazing scriptures in the Bible. <laughs> so they were in there in their persecution in their darkest hour at midnight and they begin to praise God. And you got to understand, praise shuts down process and creates suddenlies. Suddenly. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from the sleep and seeing the prison open doors, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Verse 28. But Paul called in a loud voice, do yourself no harm. We're here. We hadn't gone anywhere. Verse 29. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, that's simple, isn't it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your whole household. He said, God ain't just going to save you. He's going to save everybody and everything connected to you. You are the entry point for how many people God wants to touch. <laughs> you and your whole household. So they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. Verse 33. And he took them to the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Verse 34. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> now when he had brought them into his house, he set forth food to them and rejoiced, having believed in God with all the household. Verse 35. And when it was day, the magistrates or the judges sent the officers saying, let those men go. Chains to freedom. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word and help me to communicate well. And everybody said amen. For those of you visiting at this church, we talk to each other. Amen. So tell your neighbor on both sides, here we go, here we go, here we go. <clears throat> Anyone who's been with me any amount of time uh, knows that there are streams that run through all my messages. <clears throat> that no matter what topic I preach on, I, I just have streams that I can't get away from. We have pictures back up in our ready room where we have all our guests assembled before services. And uh, they look around the pictures because they want to see what stream me and Hope are from. And we have pictures with all the people who've invested and impacted our life over the years. And one of the streams of my messages is understanding the, the parallel between the spiritual and the natural world. I am so weary of a church that won't talk about spiritual things. I just don't get it. We got a, we got a generation crying out to know that there's something up there bigger than them. And we got a church that won't talk to them about it. We just serve them coffee and tell them to buy stuff. Got to be more. There's got to be a church where signs and wonders are back and we lay hands on the sick and they recover. There's got to be it where people can talk and, and talk in their heavenly language and people prophesy to one another and words of wisdom, words of knowledge and miracles takes place and great faith is in that. They, that those places have to exist. I want us to be such a place. And we're moving in that direction. But God created the heavens and the earth. He created the spiritual and out of the spiritual, he created the physical realm. So the spiritual is the parent. The Bible describes the spiritual one as being eternal and unchanging. The Bible describes the one that you're sitting on that chair in right now as ever changing and temporary. We think that what we are seeing and what's going around us can't change. But God said that's the only realm that's constantly changing. So whatever you're going through, this too shall pass. Because everything is temporary in this life. And so we know that the spirit realm is unchanging. I'm getting ready to go in a little bit of depth right here. So roll with me, okay? And God had access points between those two realms. It was common for God to move back and forth out of the heavens and the earth because the Bible said <clears throat> that he would come with Adam and that he would walk with Adam in the cool of the day. 
Well, Adam was not in heaven. Heaven was in the earth. I mean, Adam was in the earth. So God would come and walk with him, which means there must be access points or portals between heaven and earth. There were openings. Oh my goodness, I got so much. Nobody teaches this stuff. I love it. Nobody. Ezekiel 38. No, don't, don't go there. Just listen to him. I'm going to quote it because I didn't do this in the first service, but it just popped up in my spirit, so I must be supposed to say it. God said this against Satan. He said, this chief iniquity I hold against you. God said, I got a grudge with Satan and I'm not going to let it go. He said, because of thy trafficking. You ever wondered why evil is so heavily funded? Because the heavens don't know any diminishing resources. There's only diminishing in the natural realm. God can make everybody billionaires in this room today and heaven is not decreased at all. Heaven knows no lack. You don't come to the end of a thing in the heavens. All of the heavens are eternal. Are you following me? Say, where is he going? Ride with me, we going. Okay. And God said, before Satan was thrown out, he learned the grid. God's trying to teach his people to grid, but they won't listen to it. But Satan's got it. And that's why evil is funded heavily. Because before he was cast out of heaven, he learned the access points. He learned how to traffic between the spiritual and the natural and bring its resources to do his evil work. And God said, I hold that against you. You took knowledge you got from me and used it for your own purposes. Good. Ezekiel 38, go read that today. Powerful, powerful text. So God came and would walk with Adam in the cool of the day. When Adam sinned, those access points were cut off. Okay? So you got an earth that was never meant to operate apart from heaven. It was not meant to operate like heaven. That's why the first place in the earth was called Eden, which means heaven or perfection. It was a physical expression of the heavens that God dwelled in. Okay? Now, here's what you've got to understand about access points. God or the heavens has windows. So heaven has windows. I don't mean an old man with a gray beard up there turning a crank. That ain't what I'm talking about. Heaven has windows. I know you don't want to hear what one of these windows are, but I'll tell you one of them. And bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and see if I will not open the... That word in the Hebrew says, not open up for you the windows. It says, I will open you up the windows of heaven. God's not opening up this thing for you. You are the window and he opens you up. If you're doing all this as a closed window, I wonder what you'd look like open. You're doing all this on your ability. What if God opened you up? What if God let everybody see what's really been put on the inside of you? What if you really became a passageway where heaven comes into the earth and God uses you to bless everyone in your life and everyone connected to you? I wonder what that would really look like. So God said, bring the tithe into the storehouse and then here's what I'll do. You are a window of heaven and I will open you up. I will use you. You will be the one. Or whoever I want to get it to, you will be the window by which I get it into the earth. I want to be a window of heaven. If God wants to do it in the earth, I want to be the window. If God wants to do it in the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, I want to be a window. Does anybody want to be a window with me? I hope God looks in this building and sees a whole building of windows. I hope God looks on these cameras and sees windows everywhere. Windows, windows, windows. Somebody shout, God, open me up. So we are windows. That means if God's going to get something into the earth, he's going to use a person. Yes. 
Well, Lord, I pray that you would bless them. Okay, then you need to get up and go bless them. Well, I hope we have a good service today. You, the window, will determine that. Whether we have a good service is not up to God, it's up to the windows. I will open you up. I want to be an open window. So you are access points from heaven into earth. Hell has gates. Heaven has windows. Hell has gates. And just like heaven's windows are people, hell's gates are people. If God wants to bless you, he will send a person into your life. If hell wants to curse you, he will send a So that person you're dating and thinking about marrying, you're either getting ready to unleash a whole lot of heaven or a whole lot of hell. <laughs> Is anybody in this building with the preacher today? I want to say you're okay. <laughs> I've been saying for years, the right people enter your life, the right things start happening. <laughs> the wrong people exit your life, wrong stuff quits happening. I've always said to addicted people, who are you running with? And they're like, I got a problem. I don't want to talk about my friend. No, who are you running with? Why? Because you're not addicted to it. You're addicted to them. Because the only time you do it is when you're with them. So if I can get you away from them, you'll easily quit it. Because when the enemy wants to curse you, he opens up a gate and he brings a person. And you're doing what you're doing when you're with that person. So you got to understand the enemy is trying to bring hell into the earth, evil into the earth. And he uses evil people as access points into the earth. You got to understand the spirit realm does not have access into the earth without a body. It has to have flesh because God is a king. And when a king says a thing, it cannot be retracted even by the king. When he says it, it becomes law. And God said, let man have dominion in the earth. He didn't say let male. He said, man, let humankind have dominion in the earth. That means a spirit can't have dominion in the earth. Why does God want you to be full of the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit can't do anything in the earth without a body. I, I'm not even preaching on a salad level. I sure ain't going to get a steak, am I? I can just tell. <laughs> so in other words, it's got to have flesh. Why did Jesus have to leave heaven to save us? Because man has dominion in the earth, so the word became flesh. He can't save us from heaven. You got to have a body. So the psalmist said, a body thou hast prepared for me. And Jesus came and took on that body because he, where does this man get authority, they said? Not because he was the son of God, but because he was the son of man. He had been the son of God the whole time, but he didn't have authority in the earth until he became the son of man. <laughs> Are you following my logic? I'm going somewhere with it. Heaven has windows. Hell has gates. Life has doors. Life has doors. Life is experienced in seasons. And the exit from one season and the entry point into the next is a door. So God gets in through his people windows. The enemy gets in through his people evil, and then we walk through doors as we live life. And that is how we move from one season to the next season of our life, okay? Now, what you've got to understand is there are different kinds of doors. 
This is where the prophetic part gets. I didn't think this was an amazing message in the last service. When I left, you could hear audibly people weeping across the thing because they knew God had spoken to them. So God, give us that same result today. Some doors are physical doors. Those doors right there are physical doors, which means if you don't put forth force, they're not gonna open. Now, let me tell you the key to a door. The door is contradictory within itself because a door is there to keep things out. But the same door that keeps things out is also there to let things in. But it don't let in everything. It qualifies what gets in. You always know the value of what's on the other side of the door by how complicated the lock is. I'm not putting a $100,000 watch behind a door with a $3 lock. And I'm not putting a $10 special watch in a vault. So when I come up on the intricacies of the lock, it's telling me a lot about what is on the other side. And some of you have doors that you opened easily. And you have some of them, you've been turning that combination for years and it still has not opened. Because when there's great value on the other side, there's a great lock. When it's not very valuable, you open it easy. Everybody puts valuable things behind locks with great intricacies. Now, how do I move from one season to another and get through my door? Some doors physically open. There are some doors that are gonna take your energy, they're gonna take your action, and you're gonna have to push them open. That panic hardware on these doors, it will not open unless you go and you push it. And the first person that pushes it when we dismiss, it will open up and many will walk through it. And you may be getting ready to open a door that many people are gonna walk through. But you're gonna have to put some energy behind this thing. You're sitting there waiting for it to happen and it's not gonna happen because you are gonna have to open it. <laughs> the business is not just going to start. You're gonna have to push the door open. I've got a building that I'm looking at on the East Coast. I've been told no by about three people, so now I'm my fourth person deep. Why? Because I'm going to keep pushing it. And I'm going to find the one that'll say yes. Y'all don't know me yet. You will. <laughs> you keep pushing. These are doors that take force. These are doors that take action. These are doors that take relentlessness. These are doors that will not take no for an answer. These are times where you have to know that God has given you a thing and you will not be denied it. You have to look at it and know it's yours. I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm not talking about being pious. That's not what I'm talking about. But you know that that thing is your thing and you're not gonna be talked out of it just because it's difficult and whatever pressure and energy is needed, you are willing to apply that pressure and energy and force to make sure that that door opens and the thing on the other side comes into your stewardship and your possession. That ought to just give somebody a big amen right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm, my time's getting away from me. But then there's another kind of door. I'm telling you how, to, how seasons move. There are doors that are on a timer. You see these a lot of times in banks where it don't matter what president of what you get in there. That door's not opening till a certain time. You can bring a nuclear weapon. That's the only thing that's going to get it open because it's on a time. I cannot underscore the importance of you knowing the time 
and the moments of your life. Because the timing doors are on a cycle. And you say, man, I think I just missed it. Well, it's not terminal, but you do have to wait for the opportunity to cycle around again. <laughs> Mo Moses and Israel, 40 years of cycles. Joshua comes in three days, we're breaking the cycle. Timing is so important. God told Israel in Numbers 12, I think it is, he said, go, possess the land. They wouldn't do it for fear. The next morning, they changed their mind and said, let's try it. And they couldn't do it. Why? Another cycle's got to start now. You missed your moment. You missed your moment. <clears throat> One of the greatest displays of this, if you would allow me, is blind Bartimaeus in the Bible. Blind his whole life, blind from birth. And the Bible said that he heard Jesus was coming. <clears throat> Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing, but he couldn't see anything. So he didn't live by sight. But he heard Jesus was coming. And when Jesus started getting close to him, the Bible says, and my, this is my paraphrase, he started screaming like a mad fool. And it embarrassed everybody else because it was like, you know, they, Jesus is coming. They're on our best behavior. And here comes blind Bartimaeus. Ah! Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. Shh, everybody started telling him to be quiet. You know what the Bible said he did? I love this guy. Got louder. <laughs> so then there's sophisticated meeting. This guy's screaming his guts out. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And what happened? He says, y'all aren't blind. But I will never have this moment again. And I have a chance to break this cycle of blindness over my life. <laughs> it's been following me for years. And so now, when I see my time come around, I'm going to separate myself from the crowd and I'm going to begin as acting as foolish as I need to act because my miracle is on a timer and this is my time. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Somebody shout hallelujah. doors then some doors are proximity doors malls hospitals shopping centers you get to a certain proximity you walk in In other words, they gauge presence. I'm just going to bottom line this one. There's just some doors that are not going to open up to you until you get into the presence of God. <laughs> I remember one time my, my grandson was riding with me, and I know they, I think they run all of them off apps now, but we had the, the clicker to the garage door, and the click, 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 it was... So we're leaving a place. We went to get a little sandwich or something. We're heading back. We're still two or three miles from my house. And he just, tch, 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 tch. I'm like, son, it don't work right here. Said, Why? Tch, tch, just clicking, clicking. Said, it does not work right now. Wait, and I'll tell you when. Why, man, man? Why does it work right here? Because we're not close enough. And some of you, your door's not opening because you're just not close enough. You're just not close enough. Some doors only open with proximity. And when you get close, the door shoo. But that remote won't work, not because it's broken, but because of distance. And you're wanting God to open a God-ordained door, although you are distant from him. Heaven has windows, hell has gates, life has doors. 
Acts chapter 16 at midnight. And I use this story to close. At midnight. That's interesting, midnight. Why? Do you know what midnight is? It is the end of a day and the beginning of a day. <laughs> so Paul and Silas are no longer this and not yet that. They're at a door. Doors do not usually show up in your greatest day. They usually show up at midnight. And it said they were singing and praising God and singing hymns. What amazes me is not what they were doing. What amazes me is what they weren't doing. I'd have been complaining my head off. God, here I am out here preaching for you, doing what you've told me to do. I've left everybody. I've left family. I've left everything. And I'm just a guy out on the streets, a vagabond. I mean, I left a nice life. I was a Pharisee and I had all the, the, the niceties of being a scribe and a Pharisee and a keeper of the law. And here you are. I'm hated and I'm, I'm, I'm a castaway. And now I'm locked up. I'd have been complaining my head off. Some of you would too. I know y'all are holier than me, but pray for me today. <laughs> He's sitting there chained to a wall after his blood, his back has been beaten bloody. And he's chained to a wall. And the, and the guy starts praising. God. He's at midnight. He's at the end of a thing. He's tired. He's beaten. He's in pain. And he's chained. And he starts praising. And when he starts praising, something begins to happen. And we've always said that his praise caused the doors to come open. But that's not what happened. The Bible says God inhabits praise. God cannot resist a praiser. If you praise God, he is going to inhabit. He cannot resist it. He makes it a house. I don't care anybody will praise him. He'll come and inhabit it. If a sinner cries out and praises him, he'll come and inhabit that praise. He might not inhabit the person yet, but he will inhabit their praise. Anybody can praise him. And God comes and inhabits. Well, Paul's in this cell. So he starts praising. So God comes and begins to inhabit his praise. It ain't that God opened the door from the outside. It's that God got in the inside of that cell and burst the doors open because there was not capacity in the cell to hold the praise and the presence of God. And he knew if this door was going to open... It was going to be a presence door. This gate, this door, this passageway, I'm at the end of a thing, I'm at the beginning of a thing, and I'm locked behind this door. And this is a presence door. And with a black back that I can't touch the wall, oh, and rodents crawling across my feet. I will lift my soul and I will magnify the Lord. Because the only thing that's going to open this door was the presence of God. <clears throat> See, some of you wondering why are they even in prison in the first place? Paul went into that city of Philippi to preach. And when he did, there was a girl there that the Bible said had a spirit of divination, divining. That's especially big from about where we are on up north, Northern California, on up through Oregon and Washington State. Fortune telling, divining, tarot cards, palm reading. So this girl had an issue and a weakness by which she could foretell the future. And the Bible says in Acts 16 that everybody who would bet would go to her and she would tell them how to bet and they would get rich. So Paul comes along and realizes this girl's possessed with the devil. But now everybody around her wants her to stay that way. Be careful running with people that reinforce your issues. <laughs> they are not your friend. 
Because whenever there's a weakness, there's somebody benefiting from it. And everybody in that town is benefiting. And it's in their best interest that she stay full of the devil. Because she's making them rich. Paul comes up and realizes he cast that devil out. Now you would think somebody get free, everybody would be happy. They mobbed him and took him to the jailers. He was flogged and in prison for setting a girl free. Why? Because everybody wants to profit off of your weakness. If you can't manage your money and you can't keep your credit score, I promise you there's somebody there to benefit from it. If you didn't have a daddy to affirm you and love you right and show you what a man's really supposed to be and you've become promiscuous, there's a group of men benefiting from it. There's always somebody benefiting. If you're addicted to drugs, oh, there's so many benefactors to your drug addiction. That's the way it works. So it's in their best interest that you stay a mess. So freedom came and they locked him up. And he realizes somehow, I've come to the end of a thing. And there's a new day about to break forth. But I'm not in a push door. I'm not in a timing door. Okay. I'm not in those. This is a presence door. And only the presence of God's going to open it. Now here's where I'm ending. Play something if you would, Terrence. Thank you. Go back. But throw Acts chapter 16 up there if you would. Go to verse 25. Or, okay, 26. There was a great earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately. Look at that. Suddenly and immediately. Suddenly and immediately, because praise interrupts process. And those of you that are in a long, drawn out process, praise will eliminate it. Suddenly and immediately, all the doors were open. God kept me up last night and broke me in this morning to tell you you are on the cusp and we are on the cusp of that moment because I have lived most of my life with a door being opened here and a door being opened there and there's a building available but I don't have the funds or I've got the funds, but there's no building available. I've got the message, but I don't have the people, or I got the people and I don't have the message. And I finally got a wife, I finally got a husband, but now they tell me I can't have kids. So the door's open to the family, but the door's open to the marriage, but it's closed to the family. And I got the scholarship and the door has been open for me to go back to school, but I don't have anybody to keep my three-year-old until the door closing. And it's the frustration of not being able to take the open door because of the others that are still closed. And God spoke to my heart. I had 2,000 pages to choose from today. But this time, all the doors open. For the people that have had some doors shut in your face, I want you to stand on your feet and I want you to praise your God. Because the word for redemption is that this is not a door open here and a door closed there and a door open here and a door closed there. I hear the Lord saying today, all the doors are open. All the doors are open. All the doors are open. I'm not going to quit saying it till you receive it. All the doors are open. 
all the doors are oh, all the doors are open build somebody's faith turn around and tell three people say all the doors are open all the doors are open in here desperately is in need of a door opening. Desperate. Somebody say it again. All the doors are open. All the doors are open. All the doors are open. All the doors are <laughs> Well, how's he going to do it, Pastor? Suddenly and immediately. That's all you needed. Let me get you out of here. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and may all your doors open in Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'll see you next week. You're dismissed.